Hello everyone. Hi darlings. Hey, hey party people. Today I have with me the amazing fashion photographer Sam Breach in the studio today. Everyone welcome her. She can't hear you, but you know, whatever. Same difference, right? So today we're going to talk about fashion, we're going to talk about photography, we're going to talk about taking pretty pictures, making pretty things happen. We're going to talk about career changes, you know, because not everyone keep, you know, decides what they're going to do when they're 18 years old and sticks with that forever. I get a lot of questions on this channel where people are like, Zoe, I'm X number of years old. Is it too late for me to start being a fashion designer? The answer is no. Okay. You're either dead and then it's too late or you're alive and you still have time to do whatever it is that you want to do with your life. So Sam, Zoe, <laughs> <laughs> please tell us what you do and why you do it. Well, I'm a photographer and I do it because I love to make images that tell stories and I love to work with people and I love to capture people and I love to display emotion and I just love to be creative. So those are a lot of the reasons why I'm a photographer today. So you brought this magazine to show us some of your work. Yes. Can you flip through, show us some of your favorite images and kind of uh, share with us a little bit of your creative process? Actually, this was taken in France. I actually went on a photography photo uh, uh, workshop with a very well-known British photographer called Miss Aniela. She does surreal fashion. And she has these fantastic workshops where you can go and they put on the whole production for you and give you time with the models and lights and assistants and that kind of thing. But you, you it's not a workshop where you're taught anything. Mm -hmm. You're just kind of thrown into what it would be like in a big major trauma fire. Yeah. Yeah, so, drop you in the water, see if you swim. <laughs> so it's up to you, you know, you have to pay to go on these things. Mm -hmm. But this is how I first learned mm -hmm. how fashion shoots work. Because, you know, when you're coming from a different career, I'm sure we're gonna talk about that later, you don't really know how that, that stuff works. Mm -hmm. So um, this was a way for me to start learning about that. And I've been on a, on a few of her her workshops and it's great to work with the models, but also it's all down to you to have the vision in that moment. And it's each each model that you work with, you have one location, you work with them with that model for maybe less than an hour, mm -hmm. but you're also sharing the time with either one or two other photographers. Mm -hmm. So you have to work really fast and you have to think really fast. You have to be looking around the room all the time, trying to work out your compositions, seeing where the light, the dark is, where the story's going. So it's, it kind of throws you in the deep end and it's a very good way to practice. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that's one thing I really love to do, especially when I'm practicing, is just to be in a place with a person, maybe a stylist, and then just work out what these images are gonna be. But having said that, I do also like to prepare. I prefer to prepare. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm doing a shoot, if I, if I can go to the location first, you know, if I know if I'm gonna shoot you tomorrow outside in the courtyard here, mm -hmm. I would probably come the day before at the same time mm -hmm. to check the light, you know, to see what composition. I mean, I can think on my feet, obviously, but it's preferable to me to be very well prepared. So actually, you asked me about my process. So I have two ways of, I, you know, I don't always do it the same. If I'm doing one image, so it's like a conceptual, more in the direction of fine art kind of thing, mm -hmm. one image, I might prepare for it uh, with a brainstorming because I'm trying to tell some certain story. And then I actually storyboard it. I draw a sketch. And then if I could, I should have bought my sketch, but, but sorry, I didn't. But I could show you sketches where my final image looks exactly like my concept. Mm -hmm. So that's one way I go. But having said that, that doesn't have to be the be all and end of it, the sketch. I also allow myself room to change on the fly if better mm -hmm. ideas come along or you know, maybe your makeup artist or your hair designer has an idea on the day, hey, why don't we try this? So I'm always open to that as well. But I do like to be very well prepared if I can be. I think image. that in any field, that that's kind of the best mm -hmm. route is like know how to prepare and manage your time and think these things through but also have the ability to you know go with the flow mm -hmm. if something happens inspiration strikes and you're like okay I'm gonna chase that fairy for a minute yeah yeah exactly and 
what you in order to be able to do that you just need to practice and and know your stuff so once you know your stuff and you're comfortable and you know the technical part I mean if you don't know how to use your camera you can't taste the fairy yeah, yeah you, you can't, can't. Taste the fairy because yeah you have wrong. to have that background so you've got to skills. practice and you know keep practicing on the basic stuff and try different techniques all the time so that then you can take one of those techniques that you learned and put it out of the bag when you're actually on a shoot again these are some of the ones from France very dreamy looking yeah I love this lake it reminds me of pea soup and over <laughs> <laughs> that's pea soup that's and really over of you <laughs> That's so British of you. Pea soup and aubergine. Yes, aubergine, my favorite color. How many times did you have to get her to jump to get this? We did quite a few, but that, that's the thing. is like when you're jumping, it's hard to control your facial expression. This was done with the local uh, student, mm -hmm. and this was her final thesis piece. Mm -hmm. I had hair curler like this once when okay. I was in my 20s. Yeah, it ruined the crap out of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Being a redhead was fun for a minute. Oh, and that was back when color contacts first came out and were a big you thing. You have matching ones. Oh my god, I had green ones. <laughs> so you had a sort of Irish look? I want it to be Anna Green Gables. <laughs> <laughs> Did you put it in like pigtails? No, I was going clubbing like that. I had the red hair, the green, and the, the smoky eye, and then I would go dancing. I want to see pictures or it didn't happen. This was fun because I worked with my partner, Fred. He's a 3D artist. I used to be a 3D artist too. So he did some special effects on this one. Oh, you see, we have CGI in here. Nice. So the scarf, this was all shot, mm -hmm. and then the scarf, you know, he did an effect so it looks like water's coming off the scarf. So particles. when you shot it, there was still scarf here, and then he turned it into this, or there was no scarf? There was no scarf here. I was, in, in the shoot, I was, I had the end of the scarf and I was, mm -hmm. and then I had a, a remote so I could do both at once. Whoa. And then we did a lot of takes, obviously, and then we chose the best angles of the scarf, and then he melded the texture into the CGI. Nice. So there's a couple more here, and he did oh, different cool. kind of effects. This was a fun shoot. This was for a client. She commissioned me to show the story of young love and heartbreak. So this shows her in the throes of first love or happy, and then she gets her heart broken, and then she contemplates and nests away from the world for a while. And then she comes to the realization that she can put this behind her and she burns, you know, the past. Mm -hmm. And then she rises up the balloons. And then moving forward, she's grown up mm -hmm. and her heart is now protected. And one of the things I love doing is thinking of these stories where you can link the images together. We actually did the shots in a certain order, not necessarily the order they are here, just so that we could um, build on the makeup in the best way. Mm -hmm. So that all comes into the planning. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't necessarily go from A to B. You work out how you can change the hair from this style to that style, or the makeup, the strongest, you know. We, the second shot in the sequence has very strong makeup, but we did this shot last because we didn't want to put all the heavy eyeliner on at the beginning and then have right. to take it all off. We knew we wanted that look for that shot. I this love was, this lighting. It was like blue-green kind of cast. Mm -hmm. So this was also taken with a Miss Aniela photo workshop, but this was in Iceland. We went... Stop it! Okay, so you like did a workshop in France, yeah. did a workshop in Iceland. <laughs> and, oh. Yes. <laughs> it was fun. So the Iceland one is just one Your of Your life my... sounds terrible, Sam. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Usually on a Miss Aniela shoot, you have time alone with a photographer, so you, um, a model, so you can direct them. But for this shoot, as soon as we got there, the very first location, they started off in that way. First photographer gets some time. Second photographer gets some time. Right. I'm still waiting. Mm -hmm. Then it starts to snow. Oh, my God. Blizzard, blah, blah, blah. We're by this abandoned um, aircraft on a black beach with this whirling snow around. And suddenly, this is why people then, think fashion is so glamorous, <laughs> because sometimes it is. <laughs> and then, you know, the lights have to go into shelter, and it's all like panic, we're all in the plane. Oh my God. Trying to shelter <laughs> from the, and then at that moment, everyone realized, oh my goodness, if you don't shoot the whole time you're here, you might not shoot. Right. So from that moment, it was like a free-for-all, paparazzi, oh at every single time there was a model, all the photographers <laughs> would be... <laughs> So the way my brain works in those kind of situations is like, oh look, there's all the photographers here in a pack, 
shooting like that. Mm -hmm. I don't want the same as them. So mm -hmm. if they were over here, then I would be over here on the mm -hmm. belly or something. Mm -hmm. So the whole time I was trying to do something different to everybody else. I like that. Um, I had this brainwave that all the landscapes and environments were so alien and strange to me. They felt like they were underwater. Mm -hmm. They felt they had this kind of underwater feel to them. So my whole idea was when I came back that I would make them actually feel like they're underwater. So in post-production, oh, I added that's this, why you this very cast. blue cast. And oh, I that's put, great. You know, I put fish in some of them. There's a fish here. Oh. So that's how I then tied them all together. That's great. So these are actually oh on God. great. Okay, these are my rocks. favorite now, my new yeah, favorites. Yeah, they're, mm. they're good ones. I like them. So we have fish that I added in afterwards. Wow. This is the amazing lava fields. Mm -hmm. These are actually green in real life. They're kind of this color green, but mm -hmm. then I added more green and blue to it to wow. give it that real underwater feel. And That's then this great. final one, this is taken in a cave and the cave has a big hole in the roof. So in reality, through that roof is a bit, was a big white blob because it was actually snowing at the time and there was just white sky above. So I replaced that with fish to make it feel like it was underwater. This is amazing. And then the snow falls down into this cave through this hole mm -hmm. and it makes this big mound of snow. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, in post-production, I made the snow look like ice. Mm -hmm. So a watery ice. And then I added the jellyfish and things in. So it has this fish feels over here. like... You read Dante's Inferno where the devil is encased in ice in the innermost circle of hell? Mm -hmm. But like, that's maybe another idea for another yeah. shoot. So that was just that's just an example of how I'm on a shoot with a lot of other people who are taking pictures at the same time, but I have to do something that looks different to everyone else. And you guys, I was lucky to have do that. something different than everyone else. <laughs> Always. Did you go to school to study photography? No, I didn't. I actually went to school a very long time ago. <laughs> Um, before all of you were born, I did a degree in communication and media production. What does that mean? That was back in the UK in the 80, late 80s, very late 80s. And uh, at the time, there were hardly any media degrees in the UK at all. It was a brand new thing. It was mm -hmm. one of the very first media degrees. It covered audio production, video production, and computer graphics. And I started off as a computer graphics artist, actually. So I spent over a decade in London working for post-production companies on advertising, television title sequences, corporate videos. And then I started to work on mo uh, movies, special effects on movies, when the Hollywood companies started coming to London to employ people outside of California doing wow. that kind of work. And then because it kind of that industry grew very quickly back here in the US people were looking for experienced computer graphic artists and it was when the business was booming back in the early 2000s and at that time a company called Industrial Light and Magic invited me to come over here and work for them so um, I decided to come try out America so that's what I did and I, I worked on Star Wars and I worked on Harry Potter and Pirates of the Caribbean. Holy crap! I got how paid. I, I got Sam, paid. I've known you for years. How did I? How did I never know this stuff? <laughs> I oh got paid. God. I got paid to um to look at Johnny Depp all day long. <laughs> like paint, you know, like your life is the best. <laughs> so you got paid to sit around and stare at Johnny Depp's beautiful masterpiece of a face for hours and hours on end. Yeah, beat that. <laughs> no, you can't. You really can't. I lost my job with them after five years or so. And at that point, I got a job working at the Electronic Arts Games mm -hmm. Company. And I was working for the Sims division, Sims Games. Mm -hmm. So I worked a lot on Sims 3. And I built a lot of, I helped build the worlds that the Sims lived in. I was never into games, really. I was kind of happy there because it was very creative. It's the kind of company where they let you be autonomous and if something needs to be done, you can just go and do it. And I appreciate that. And they appreciate their staff and it was, you know, it was a good place to work. But when it came to the end product, I can't say I was, I wasn't a huge gamer. Mm -hmm. So it was more like a job to me. Mm -hmm. 
So um, when I got laid off from there, that's when I was like, oh, what should, what should I really do now? And mm -hmm. the whole of my career had been spent making digital imagery mm -hmm. for other people, mm -hmm. not for myself. Mm -hmm. So at the time, at the end of the time that I was at EA, I had started doing photography as a hobby mm -hmm. and started to realize that I could direct my own imagery and I didn't just have to... I guess I'd gained enough confidence by that point to realize that I could art direct my own work and that I could I could have my own ideas mm -hmm. and I didn't just have to ask somebody else that I could do everything. So mm -hmm. that's that's where I started doing photography. And so now we're at the beginning of your photography as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And then so you decided to kind of make a go of it full time after getting laid off of EA. Mm -hmm. So when I started photography, I actually used to be a very boring photographer who used to just take her little camera out and go for hikes and take pictures of things mm -hmm. that interested me. Urban hikes mostly. I take pictures of doorways and benches and houses and not very, no people, mm -hmm. absolutely no people. And I did that for a couple of years and then I joined Google Plus. Mm -hmm. And everyone I know, everyone laughs at Google Plus. But I have to say, it changed my life. Yeah? Yeah, because on Google+, Plus, I found this community of creative photographers who were doing self-portraits that were crazy and imaginative and creative. And I also found another bunch of people that were doing uh, scavenger hunts where they were competing against each other and just making these crazy creative images based on words. And I was like, hey, I want to do that. So that's how I started doing more creative, conceptual photography. And I just found that I loved it. And I loved those people that I found in that community. And that's really how the whole thing began. So first of all, you know, when you don't have a lot of images under your belt to try and persuade people that you can shoot them, you have to, it's a, it's a kind of act of faith on both parts. So it's, you can either start off by paying a model who's experienced because they're doing it to be paid mm -hmm. and then they'll help you by modeling for you or you can find a model who has no experience mm -hmm. so they'll take a chance on you because you have no experience too. Mm -hmm. So I tried both of those routes and slowly um, I just kept persisting and asking people to work with me and my images got better and better and then Eventually, it got to the stage where people will come to me and want to work with me. Nice. So these are all um, networking opportunities that allow you to be creative with other creative people and also build your portfolio at the same time. So that's the route I took to, you know, get these kind of images together that you see in here. A lot of these are collaborations, mm -hmm. but some are, you know, a few of them, several of them, are also paid jobs in this in this book so first of all I was terrified about having a person well, how do I speak to them you know what how do I tell them what to do mm -hmm. but I found that going back to the organization you know being able to show them in advance this is my storyboard mm -hmm. these are the people we're working with mm -hmm. you know getting a makeup person on board getting a hair person on board getting a stylist on board all these things help everybody on the team have the confidence that the pictures are going to turn out really well because everyone's putting a lot of effort into it. You so, look like a professional. You're like, I yeah. have a plan. We're going to do these things. Mm -hmm. And so you look exactly. like, you know, yes, I'm in charge and I have these things under control. And so people have confidence that things are going to work out, you know, reasonably well. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you talk to many, many photographers, they will all complain about model mayhem and say the models are flakes, they don't show up half the time, blah, 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 I had a model bail on me, blah, blah, blah. I have never had anyone bail on me, mm -hmm. apart from one time where somebody had a very valid excuse and told me the day in advance. No one has ever bailed on one of my shoots, and I put that down to my organization mm -hmm. and the fact that I treat every, every collaboration, even mm -hmm. if it's not a job, in a professional way, I make it very clear that there are people investing time and effort into mm -hmm. this shoot and money as well. And I treat the people on the shoot very well. I've been on a paid shoot. 
but the model was almost fainting because the producer hadn't provided a glass of water even. I've, I've you know? been there too, and I'm like, <laughs> what is going on? Like, who's in charge? Like, it's a 10 hour shoot, but there's no food or drinks. Like, exactly. that's crazy. And yeah, so you have to think about all these things. You want your models to be happy. The last you thing reap you what want, you sow, yeah. you know, and you put professionalism and care out there, and you get that in return. Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah. So, I mean, if you want to work as a professional photographer, even when you're trying to get to that stage, when you're practicing, when you're building up your portfolio, when you're building teams to try and work with, you have to behave in a professional way before you even get the jobs. Because then people will like you and you will get the jobs. They'll follow that. I, you know, I feel like you should always be behaving like you're getting paid to be a certain way and like everything costs money. Because eventually that's where you're aiming towards, where, you know, you're on a paid gig mm -hmm. and you have to follow a budget and you have to plan all these things out and you have to behave a certain way. Like, you behave that way in preparation for the jobs that you want to get in the Absolutely. future. Yeah, it's good practice because mm -hmm. if you go on a professional shoot and you, you're not behaving that way, that's probably the first and last time you're working <laughs> with those people, right? Pretty much. <laughs> So how did you learn all the technical skills? Like we talked about your creative process and stuff, but you had to, I mean, I know photographers, they tell me things and they throw words around. I have no idea. I'm like, what's an F-stop? <laughs> that is something, right? <laughs> something. So, so how did you learn these things? So initially I used to be a terrible kind of photographer that just had, you know, I had my digital SLR back in the day when I just took pictures in the street. Mm -hmm. And... I we just all start used somewhere. the P mode because I didn't understand all those other settings. Mm -hmm. So um, eventually, actually, when I was at Electronic Arts, myself and two of my colleagues, we started a little photo club. Cool. And we would meet at lunch times every couple of weeks and go on little outings together and mm -hmm. take photographs. At that time, someone recommended me a course, uh, which was learning camera basics, how to shoot in manual. So I did that. This was probably five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. And after that, I decided never to shoot in P again and always shoot manual. So I just learned it like that. Mm -hmm. And then that's just using your camera. And there's so many other things on top of that. There's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, evolving a style of your own, how you like to shoot. Mm -hmm. Then lighting is a whole other thing. So once you master everything with natural light, then you need to inter start introducing studio lighting or extra lighting to so that you actually have control over the light, adding reflectors in, um, all sorts of things like that. So the only way you can do this is by practicing. And, I, and again, I, I practice a lot on myself still. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like... I she said the P word, it's practice. <laughs> Hashtag practice, not magic. <laughs> Absolutely, I believe in that. I don't, I don't, talent is a myth. Talent is a myth. It's hard work and practice. I, I say this at every interview. I just love it when other professionals come in here and just say the same shit <laughs> I say all the time. <laughs> I didn't pay her to say that. I don't have that kind of money, okay? I can't afford Sam. I remember one time my boyfriend, you know, I've been working really hard on something and he was like, wow, you're getting good at this. You're so talented. I'm like, but, you know, I wasn't good at this, like, Last year, mm -hmm. do you think I just woke up today and became no, talented? No. no, no. I practiced and practiced and practiced. It's like, you yeah. know, I take a self portrait. People see my po self portrait, they're like, oh, that's good. They don't know that behind the scenes, I took that picture 600 times to, before I, I got love it, it right. Just to go back to when you were saying, when you were first getting started, you're taking, you know, little dumb images with your digital, with your little photography club. like. You know, you kind of downplayed it, but I actually really love that that's how you got started because it plays into a couple of things that I think are good for beginners, no matter what your age is and no matter kind of what project or field you want to go into is one, when you're getting started, you typically get discouraged really easily because you're getting started and you don't really know anything and at every turn, everything is a question. And so I think that it really helps people when they have accountability partners. When you guys are like, it's very lighthearted and fun, but at the same time, you're kind of in it together. 
and you guys are kind of like each other's support like this is fun let's go do this or you know I shot this with my camera and we were at the same place at the same time so you know a little compare contrast and also it's like you know you have to get started somehow mm -hmm. like the first thing I ever sewed okay I was in Girl Scouts I was eight okay and the first thing I ever sewed it was our for our sewing badge it was a dumbbell, okay, so it had an elastic band, and you just, you know, sewed it up, folded it over, and you top stitched the waistband with the elastic in there. And then you sewed the side seams, and then you had, like, a folded up hand, and then you top stitched the head. It's basically a fabric tube, okay? And I remember being so proud of it, because even then, I knew I wanted to go into fashion, and I was like, I made a skirt, bitches. I'm eight years old, I made a skirt. <laughs> so, yeah, I think those are all good things, to, like, start small, mm -hmm. not, like go all crazy, kind of see if you actually enjoy something before you kind of launch into a I new direction. Too much gear. You can also oh, yeah. start off without too much gear. And there's so many resources on the internet about, you know, how you can be creative with lighting and you can give us certain pieces of equipment or you can use things that you already have. Um, so don't be discouraged and don't think you have to have like a lot of expensive gear and I'm by this stage I do have quite a nice lot of gear but I certainly didn't start off that way and I just always made the best of what I had and I also adding on from what Zoe said finding communities online that push you to try out creative things together like a self portrait community not where you're just taking selfies with your cell phone where you actually have to think about a self-portrait and set it up and you know creative make problem a story solving yeah or, you know a theme that you're following you know that's that's a great way to start especially if you can find a group of people who are wanting to do the same thing so you can all get together and encourage each other mm -hmm. because it really helps to be part of a community looking back on your career is there anything you would have done differently my whole career mm-hmm I don't think I would because I feel like this, my life has just been this, I kind of believe in fate. That's not really good, is it? Because it goes against everything we just said. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been a person that planned out my whole life. Mm -hmm. It just kind of happened to me. And I always enjoyed the way it happened to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I had crazy experiences. I... I worked in Soho in London in post-production houses, advertising, it was glamorous. I worked on movies, I worked on video games. It all sounds glamorous, you know. At one point, I didn't even go into that, but for a, for a year I edited a little magazine and then for another point in my life I used to be on British Breakfast TV, um, you know, like crazy stuff. So all these things just kind of happened to me and it was just... Just, yeah, just because I plan projects to a T doesn't mean I plan my life to a T. <laughs> like, I, I don't have a five-year plan. So, yeah, like, I plan projects, but I don't try to, like, force my life to sit in a certain... Yeah, and yeah. I, I think I'm like that, too. I'm, I'm kind of take, oh, you know, chasing... What did you call it earlier? Chasing the fairy. Chasing the fairy. It's like, ooh, that looks good. I'll do this. But um, now with my career... It's a little more difficult to me, for me because I actually want to do photography. Mm -hmm. But what I find myself is very difficult is the business side of things. Mm. So, you know, you were talking about people giving up because they fail. And I get a lot, very frustrated with the business side because I try something mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. And then I'm like deflated, like, mm, that doesn't work. I'm mm -hmm. not, you know. So for me, that's my real challenge. Mm -hmm. So that's where I have, I'm trying to persevere right now, mm -hmm. um, you know, to get my name more out there and get more actual clients. So promotion is hard work. Promotion is hard work, but it's, it's just another aspect and you have to, you have to give it a lot of time and energy in order to make it happen. And I can't give up on that because that would be such a shame because I've got all this other stuff to back me up. You know, as soon as I get that, the... Yeah, in the, the logical part of my brain, when I'm thinking clearly, you know, mm -hmm. highly caffeinated and everything, <laughs> I know that, you know, as much as I have spent time cultivating my craft and drawing and teaching and learning how to teach better and all these things, you know, there are people who have spent their time learning how to market and promote and 
you know, that is what they are good at. And that is also something that we have to practice. It is a skill set that we can learn or hire someone if we can, you know. And so in my logical brain, I know this. And so it's like, yes, it's just like anything else I say, it's like, learn the process and practice it. And then my other half of my brain that's more emotional is like, anytime one of my viewers says, Oh my God, why don't you have more viewers? I'm like, I don't know. Why don't I? <laughs> like, so yeah, it, it, it goes back and forth. So yeah, yeah I hear yeah. you. But I think it is, you know, telling yourself, no, this is also a skill set that I just haven't learned yet. And you also have to give the time to it. Mm -hmm. You know, all the time that you give to the photography, you can see that it's given you good results mm -hmm. because you've really given a lot of time to it. And, and then you energy. look at what you used to make and you put them next to each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then when it comes to the marketing, well, you know, no, if you have the choice, should I go and market myself today or should I go and make this crazy self-portrait? What are you going to do? Oh, crazy self-portrait. That, no, no, no. Th that must... is my dilemma every morning. <laughs> yeah, no, you've got to, you, sometimes you've just got to say no, no, I've got to go on this path with the, the business and the marketing right now because so that's really sit important. down and redo all your thumbnails for your videos mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no but I want to draw this pretty thing yeah exactly <laughs> that's our dilemma right mm. that's the thing that's holding us back thank you so much for coming thank you for having me I learned so many things about you today all right guys so that was my awesome uh, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> praying for it all right, so that was my interview with Sam. I hope you found that inspiring and gave you a lot of food for thought. It gave me tons of food for thought. As usual, you know, check out her links in the info box if you want to see more of her work and leave questions for either me or Sam in the comments. And if you leave questions for Sam, I'll make sure to tap her and make sure that she takes a look at your questions. And uh, I will see you in the next video.